it's been an odd year. I've been I'm in, in residence right now at the New York Public Library at the building with the lions. Um, <laughs> can we just leave that open so people can sure. wander in? Right. Sure. Um, and you know, any of you who've worked in China know this. It can be really hard to get access to archives and to resources, and so much has been lost. Um, and so this nine months I've spent at the 42nd Street Library have been incredible because there is such a wealth of uh, history, Chinese sources, Japanese sources about what I'm writing about. And some of that is there because of uh, Henry Luce. So, and the library recognizes that. And uh, just that's, this is kind of a nice full circle for me, uh, being able to speak here before I leave. Okay, this beautiful photo on the front of the book um, is by the man who produced Don McLean's American Pie, if you know that song. And I should point out that the publisher reversed the image because there's a thing in publishing that psychologically readers need to be told the action is moving so you open the book. That's why the characters are reversed on the front of it. Um, that's the kind of inside, inside information I can provide. So I came to China by accident. Uh, I grew up in Minnesota. I was fluent in Spanish. I was going to be a Spanish teacher. I had volunteered with United Farm Workers on the Texas-Mexico border. I thought I was going to spend my life working in Latin America doing farm issues. I grew up in a rural area of Minnesota. Um, and after I was a senior at university at Wisconsin-Madison, I applied for the Peace Corps. And Peace Corps called and said, we, you're fluent in Spanish, that's great. We'd like to send you to Turkmenistan. And I said, well, they don't speak Spanish there. And they said, oh, you're right. How about Vladivostok? And I said, again, not a Spanish thing. And this went on where they offered me um, Kiribati, which is a small group of Pacific <laughs> islands. They offered me uh, it was it, Tunisia, which had a little bit of Spanish speaking at the time. But anyway, it went on and on. They offered me seven countries, and I kept saying no, 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 no. And they finally said, look, it's not Club Med, it's the Peace Corps. You have to say yes to something. And I said, no, thank you. I don't want to do it then. Um, and it was three weeks before I was graduating and ending my student teaching, and the phone rang again, and they said, China, take it or leave it. And I said, you've got to be kidding me. I don't speak any Chinese. I can't even use chopsticks. And they said, again, take it or leave it. And so I was on a plane three weeks later going to China. And I was posted in Sichuan. I was in southwest China in a rural area between Chengdu and Chongqing, if you can picture that. And I was the first volunteer. We weren't even Peace Corps. We were U.S.-China friendship volunteers because Peace Corps kind of rightfully had been granted a CIA front uh, by Mao. Um, and when I got to Peace Corps, they didn't know what to do with me. And so they handed me a basketball, and they put me on their college basketball team. So my Peace Corps experience was two years of language learning, playing basketball, and teaching English and to wonderful students. So I had a really nice time of it. And then I moved to Beijing. And when I first moved to Beijing in 97, I was living way out here in Haidian, uh, in Shangdi, if you guys know anything about that part of Beijing, past Yemingan, past the Old Summer Palace, past Tsinghua, um, in a very rural area, and I loved it. But I used to come into the city, you know, this is the, what's now the second ring road, this is the old Ming era imperial wall, and I used to come into the city starting in 97, and you know, you just start noticing restaurants that you enjoyed going to the week before were now a pile of rubble, uh, hutong, you know, the alley neighborhoods that you visited in these areas, let's say, uh, were being torn down, and again, this is before the Olympics were awarded to the city, uh, this massive redevelopment was underway. Now, when we talk about old Beijing here, this is an area about the same size as Manhattan Island, right? about half the size of San Francisco. The Beijing government uh, rightfully says, look, we've, we've already protected 25% of our old heritage. And you can see these shaded areas are the areas that have been marked for protection, but most of them are not inhabited by people. Uh, so it's one thing to say, this is Tiantan, the Temple of Heaven. This is Gugong, Forbidden City. This is Tiananmen Square, all the way down here. And this is Zhongnanhai, most of this area here in the leadership compound. So it may be true that 25% of, of old Beijing is protected, uh, but in terms of inhabited old Beijing, these old Hutong neighborhoods, uh, when I moved in, it was about 18% remained. Uh, now it's down to under 12%. So one out of every eight Hutong have been raised. Um, as I say in the book, typically for Beijing, there's no exact numbers on how many Hutong even exist in Beijing, let alone are being torn down. So... I think it's time to write a book when the book you want to read hasn't been written. And I was really surprised at how no one had done a book about why Beijing was undergoing these changes, first of all. What was being lost? And frankly, should we be sad about it? You know, if you've been a tourist in Beijing, you know the Hutong are very pretty. 
they're built at a one-to-one -one ratio. You know, there is, the street is as wide as the buildings are tall, so there's this very, very dense feel to it. Uh, and they're lovely to walk through. But I wanted to know what was it like to live inside of these places. So I went to Tsinghua for a year and learned uh, to read Chinese because I wanted to use the archives in the city. And I ended up picking, you know, so much was being torn down by the time I moved in in 2005 that what was really left to me to choose from was these two neighborhoods here. This is Shen Yuko, which has all been torn down, Fresh Fish Junction. And this area over here is Da Shilar, or Da Jalan. And again, we're just south of Tiananmen Square. <laughs> We're outside Zhongyangmen, or the front gate, Tiananmen is also called. This is the last of the great gate towers from this part of the city. This is a picture from the 1920s. You see the rickshaws here. Um, after it had burned down in the Boxer Rebellion, a German architect uh, named Rothschild rebuilt it, so he added these little embrasures over the, over the windows. This is a kind of a German, a pan-European look to the gate. And the neighborhood... It was interesting, during um, the Qing dynasty, the Qing, you know, were Manchu emperors, and they had a series of edicts that started putting Han Chinese, who weren't bannermen, outside of the imperial city. And so Han Chinese moved to, a lot of them moved outside of the imperial city wall to Da Jialan, to this neighborhood. So it kind of became the Chinatown of Beijing. So Peking acrobats, Peking duck, uh, Peking silk, uh, Peking ceramics and whatnot all really flourished here very dense neighborhood of lanes, and the area takes its name from these gates, uh, Da Jalan. I don't, it's never been a really good translation of it. I guess you would translate it as big fence or big wicker gate. Um, to prevent thieves at night, uh, the emperor decreed that these lanes would have gates on either end of them, that they could be locked at night and seal the shops off within. Here's a shot from uh, Google Maps just to orient ourselves again. This is Chairman Mao's mausoleum. This is the gate I just showed you, Zhongyangmen, here. And then this is Da Jalan. This side over here is Shen Yukou. And here you can see the new road that was put in, um, and a lot of this is, is gone now. But this is my neighborhood. Um, I was really attracted to it for a couple of reasons. One is that it's a half square mile. It's a square kilometer. It's easy to get around in. Vatican City is the same size and has 750 people. Uh, this has 57,000 people living in it. It's one of the densest urban environments in the world. And most of these people are living in single-story housing, so it's even denser than usual. I also liked it, too, because this would have been the moat of the imperial city in former times going across here. But you see, you know, when Marco Polo came to Beijing in the 13th century, he remarked that the Hutong were as straight and rigid as a chessboard. And you know, Beijing people often don't say turn left, turn right. They often say go north, go south, because it's so easy to get around in the city. Not in this neighborhood. This neighborhood was outside imperial planning codes. And so you see the Hutong here, it, they look more like capillaries than they do bones. Um, a lot of the streets were filled in canals or areas that were settled by people over time. So in this half square mile area, we have 114 Hutong um, and again, 57,000 people. I was also drawn to it as a writer because unlike most of old Beijing, I could take an image like this off Google Maps and then go back and find the same exact street grid. This is a map from the 1920s. Uh, this is hard to do in Beijing, you know, to actually trace your history back. All the way back to, this is a blow up of one part of the neighborhood. This is the first map of Beijing um, that was done in 1757, a Qianlong era map the Jesuits did, which was detailed all the way down to you know, each individual structure. This right here is the start of Liu Lichang, if you've been to Beijing, the old um, kiln area where they would glaze the roof tiles for palaces. What is that name again? Liu Lichang. Okay. Yeah, you know. I was there last uh, Yeah. <laughs> so there it is. And this is the mosque that's in our neighborhood still. Uh, the school that I taught in is this area right here. And then this right here is actually my house, believe it or not. <laughs> um, that's my bike. See, our rooftop needs weeding here. Um, you know, not. it was difficult to find a place to rent. You know how Beijing is. Its social networks are just like its street grid. Everything is very horizontal. If you need something, you ask somebody, and he or she passes you on to the next person. And I started looking on Cine.com and Sohu.com, you know, looking at, at ads online. And often I would find a place to rent, and then the landlord would call back within the week and say, ooh, it's been marked that it's going to be torn down. Um, so it took me some time to find this place right here. And you can see, you know, there's nothing very glamorous. Um, 
the widow, who I'll talk about in a second, the older woman that I live with, she loved it, though, because her feet were always on the ground. You know, Beijing has this idea of JDT, right? You're always touching uh, the elements. And we had stone, and we had some mud, and we had rock, you know, uh, wood in the house and whatnot. The courtyard was interesting, too, because it's not your typical layout where you walk in off the street and there's a screen and then you get into a larger courtyard. It took me two and a half years to get into the Beijing City Archives. And when I did, you'd think I could get online you know, or on a computer there and just type in my street name and find something about the house. But instead, when you walk into the archives, you're literally faced with a wall of blue cloth bound books written in traditional characters. And you have to pull books off and try to find as much as you can about your street. And what I ended up finding about this house, I did find the household register for it of who built it and who used to live there. And it was a merchant family from Shandong who sold traditional medicine out the front of the house. And then they subdivided it inside. So there was a, court, there's a smaller courtyard at the front. There's another one right here. There's one back in this corner. And there's another one at the farthest back. And because the farthest back one has the worst light and is dampest, that was probably where they had their servant live, which is where I moved in. Uh, people in the neighborhood called me Da Diju. That was the big okay. landlord because I had two rooms. I have rooms right next to I have a bedroom here and then my living room. There's three people living in this corner room, one person living in this small area here. Uh, the widow lives in here, and there was three people living here, and then this is a kitchen. So we were all you know, crammed in this together. No toilet, no hot water. We had a cold water tap, no heat, uh, no air conditioning, obviously. But I did have broadband internet. Because on the way, on the march toward the Olympics, um, Beijing Telecom promised anybody who wanted to have internet installed could. And so I said, I'll take you up on that. And they actually did come out to the house and string a wire over the rooftop down into my house, which is great. So my mornings would begin with baseball on the internet usually, and the widow would be blaring CCTV 11, which is the opera channel. which is always on. See the clanging gongs in the morning. Um, this is how the Beijing police view themselves. <laughs> but the, uh, the motto here, or the warning here, I think, is, is pretty typical, you know, of how strangers are received in Beijing, especially. Um, as a foreigner or, or as anybody, YD, the, the migrant workers, have to do this, too. I had to register with the police. And there's hostels in the area, but no one, a foreigner, had never lived in the area before. And so you can imagine, when you're starting a precedent in China, the answer is always no, 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 because why stick your neck out? Um, and it took a long time for me to work on the police to be able to officially live here. And the way I did it is I waited them out, and they finally called me one day and said, you have to come into the police station. And I thought, oh, boy, this isn't good. And I came in, and they didn't offer tea, and they didn't offer cigarettes, and they sat me down, and they said, we've got a big problem. And I said, yeah? And they said, uh, we have to put on this Christmas pageant. And we want to tell our fellow officers why foreigners hang stockings over the fireplace at Christmas time. So could you please translate? We printed something out on the Internet in Chinese. Could you translate this into English for us and help us? And so I did. And then, of course, they're like, oh, you should stay in the neighborhood. You know, you're wonderful. And they give me my big red chop and they let me stay. And the other thing I did for them is as the Olympics approached, they wanted me to teach them every swear word in English so they would know when a foreigner was cursing at them. So they would take me out for beer and dumplings, and I would just call them every name in the book, and they would smile and sit and write it all down, you know. It was great. And then teach me back in turn. Um, it's just on my students. By the way, some of these photographs are by Mark Leong, who's a National Geographic photographer. Um, I was saying earlier, people in the neighborhood were mad when their pictures weren't in the hardcover edition. So Mark came and shot pictures of people for the soft cover edition. They wanted their photos in the book. But I realized quite quickly, you know, you see where I was living. I was so far off the street that if I was going to live there, I wasn't going to see anything or have anything to write about or experience the neighborhood. So um, I ended up running into, actually, not these kids, but a group of kids. And I realized, well, there's a school, you know, one lane away. Uh, and so I went to the gate of the school here. Oh, I'll go back. One thing I should say before I go on, too, is that this neighborhood, these aren't architectural masterpieces. I think that's one thing that gets misreported about when we talk about old Beijing, Hutong. You know, a lot of um, these are very ramshackle structures that were put up after the Tangshan earthquake in 76. And you can see again, you know, it's, it's not um, cobblestones, you know, like uh, Nanlo Guxiang or those newer areas of Beijing that have been remade. It's patchwork asphalt, um, a lot of tarps on the rooftops. This is actually a hot water heater here. But, you know, exposed wires or overhead wires as opposed to buried wires. It's not something opulent. 
and the students here, you know, this is very typical. Handmade clothes, uh, handmade toys also. And this little girl is eating in every photo I have of her, which always <laughs> interests me, <laughs> eating her manto here, which is a nice say with a bauza. Um, but one thing about the neighborhood, too, you know, it was one of these rare areas in Beijing, too, where you didn't see Dairy Queen, Starbucks, McDonald's yet, obviously. It was still uh, snacks because there was a lot of migrant workers living here that could prepare these sort of snacks. This is, I'll close on this picture too, I'll come back to it, but this is our main thoroughfare here. This is Yen Shoujie, um, which an urban planner came and visited me once and he said, you know, everything you need except for open heart surgery maybe is on this street. And it is true. I mean, I was surprised too. The community loved their neighborhood, not because of the houses. They hated the housing. And many of them would very willingly take a, a large lump sum payment to get a modern house but they love the convenience of the neighborhood and being able to walk to everything and get their cat food here and their tea here and here's a chow shirt and here's a grocery store here and have snacks and so on and so on. It's very, very convenient to get around, especially for the elderly. Like the widow is 80 some years old and she could shuffle out to get her stuff and shuffle back and not deal with staircases or crossing streets. Or elevators. Or elevators, yeah, she's terrified of elevators. These are some of my students here. It cracks me up. You know, they're, they're wearing the Anchan. They're wearing, they're wearing the safety hat that you have to wear to identify yourself to cars, even though there's no cars in the hutong, but rules are rules. And then these are my sixth grade students, and so they're too cool to even wear their track suits or their hats. So these are some of my students. This is Sean Pelan and Wu Liwei. Here she has her, her safety hat on. So I realized I had to do something in this neighborhood. I had to play a part, or else it was going to be... Um, a very non-eventful period of research and I was just going to be staring at people all day. So I went to the school and I knocked on the gate and I said, I'm a, a teacher and I'd like to volunteer. And their reaction was the same as people always gave me in Peace Corps. When I was in Peace Corps, people always felt very sorry for me. It was like, what kind of a country sends its young people overseas to work with strangers? You know, shouldn't you be helping your own family and your own neighborhood? You know, did you do something wrong? Have you been <laughs> exiled here? Uh, and the school, it took, again, another four months to process all the paperwork. And I had, I have a file, of course, because I was in Peace Corps. Um, and it took a while to get all the permissions from the police and also the Education Bureau. And then I was allowed in. And I taught the same group of students, grade five, grade, grade four, grade five, grade six. I was really lucky to be able to follow them. Here's their textbook that I taught them for three years. We hear about this great Chinese educational juggernaut, um, but this is what the kids learned from. This is my good friend Maki. Maki is the star of their English lessons, and if you can picture Truman Capote on helium, you'll get the idea of what Maki sounds like. It's, um, it's one of those. And I could never understand the thing he was saying. We had to play a DVD before the beginning of each class, and I could never follow along. And the students and I often, you know, obviously went off the book uh, because Maki was so difficult. But the kids had English uh, three times a week for 45 minutes each time. Here's my classroom. Uh, the day I started, actually, this is fall 2005. You can guess what the curriculum was aimed at right from the get-go. All their classes, their science class, their PE class, their uh, history class, everything was... Olympic themed, you know, based about the games that were coming up. And again, because our school, you know, Beijing has really opulent middle schools now with running tracks and swimming pools and climbing walls. But because our neighborhood was slated for destruction, uh, there wasn't a lot of effort being put into the upkeep anymore. You know, we had one fan and the kids sat in rows here. But not too many kids. Not too many kids. I was really lucky. My classes were small. They were 18 to 20. Wow. Yeah, that was a nice change. I was, I was very, very lucky. Yeah. If I were a Beijing, I'd say Tar, Tar Hu Tong Shui Xiao. Yeah. I don't know what, uh, when I was in Peace Corps, when I was doing, I did teacher training, and so I'd go to elementary schools, and there'd be 40 kids in a classroom, you know, in Sichuan. That's where I am. Yeah. I, 60 and some Oh my gosh. But you were in a senior. Oh, that's true. That was senior. These are grade four kids here now. Um, and then, you know, this is a nice illustration. I think that <laughs> Beijing, like the whole country, had to count down how many days there were left until the opening ceremony of the Olympic Games. And most schools had electric clocks that would do that for them. But our school was poor, and so we counted it down ourselves. But no single classroom could agree with another classroom how many days there were until the start of the Olympics. In one classroom, there was always 973 days until the start of the Olympics. It was this nice frozen in time kind of feel to it. 
Um, but I liked the school for that reason, and also the kids were very rambunctious. You know, people always ask me, like, the students must have been very well-behaved. And No, they were kids. You know, they were fourth-grade kids who wanted to be kids. And there were also no clocks in the classroom, which was nice. You can kind of pace your lessons the way you wanted to. But aside from the students, this was my, the best part of my job. This is the view from my classroom. See the Western Hills out here? And the students and I, you know, I had them keep um, dictionaries. They wrote their own dictionaries over a period of three years. Because you know how students are. They ask you, how do you say something? And then you tell them and they forget and they ask you again, how do you say? So I had them keep track of their vocabulary. And one of the ways we started it was um, we'd look out the window as a class and I would ask them how to say certain things. And it was really surprising to me how many trees exist in the Hutong, how many separate kinds of trees. You know, there's fruit trees and there's flowering trees. Um, and Beijingers often say that the hutong are a sea of green. And that's surprising. I said the hutong were a sea of, you know, a swamp of gray kind of thing. But they really are a sea of green. It's green when you get up. And the other thing my students and I would do is I'd point at buildings. You know, I'd point at Chairman Mao's mausoleum or the Great Hall of the People. And I'd ask them, what is that? And they wouldn't know. But one day, we had a big pair of golden arches go up right here. And, of course, the students all knew that was McDonald's. And then this had just landed when I moved into the neighborhood. And if you can believe it, that's a Walmart right on the edge of our lanes. You know, it really does feel like a spaceship just sort of <laughs> levitated down here while traditional sales still went on the lanes. And I was surprised at how much people loved Walmart. But when you think about it, Walmart is a hutong. I mean, it has everything you could want. That street I showed you earlier, it's all under one roof. And it's heated, and it's air-conditioned, and the grandmothers liked it because there was no bargaining over prices. And if you were illiterate, you could still figure out what products were what, you know, without having to ask somebody behind the counter, you know, can I compare these two things? Um, and you'd often walk into Walmart, and there would just be groups of aunties standing there talking, you know, not buying anything, <laughs> just hanging out. It was like a, a be-in kind of place. <laughs> so this, is, this neighborhood's all gone now, but it really did just land right on the edge there. The recyclers, people who buy waste for a living, loved Walmart, too, because everything in Walmart comes in a package. Mm -hmm. So you always have a bottle or a box, everything you buy. Uh, here's the ubiquitous symbol that, you know, crept over Beijing. Um, again, this is chai. This is to destroy. And once this is painted on your house, it always happens at night, and no one has ever seen anyone actually paint this character. Uh, it happens mysteriously. Once this is on your walls, you know, you're a goner. There's no fighting City Hall. Um, but again, this program didn't begin because of the Olympics. It actually started in 1991. It was called Weifang Gaizao, the old dilapidated housing renewal plan. Um, and originally from 91 to 2001, this was actually, I think, a benevolent plan. The idea was to start on the edges of the old city and move inward and tear down this old dilapidated housing and build new housing on the site. Don't build commercial space, but actually keep the residents there. But then I'll do one quick set piece here. A couple things happened at once in Beijing in the 90s. One is that the central government cut off funding to districts and said you have to raise your own revenues. There was never, there was no longer going to be a central fund that gave West, you know, Xicheng, Dongcheng, Xuan, Wuchuan, these districts are funding for services. The districts had to raise their own money. So how do they do that? This coincided about the same time Deng Xiaoping said it's okay to have, pro you know, a property market. It's okay for uh, work units to start selling their housing to their employees. So you have district governments trying to raise money, and the way they do that is to sell rights to the land, right, to developers. And you also have private housing being built. You also have, for the first time, real enforcement of height restrictions in the old city. Beijing has a unique skyline. You can picture it's saddle-shaped. You know, the tall buildings are on the edges, except for the Beijing Hotel. That's the rare exception. But um, what that meant was is that building space, commercial space and housing space became um, less and less in the inner city. You couldn't build these high rises to house people. So as district governments were flipping the land rights to developers, developers wanted to make money, of course, and the way they were doing that is building more commercial space and office space than they were actual housing. So up until 2001, when you were moved out of your house, you were assigned a new apartment. The rule was is that a developer, if it kept you within 12 kilometers of your old house, um, it wouldn't be penalized by the city. And so you think like 12 kilometers isn't that far, but it actually is if you know Beijing. From the Forbidden City, that's out past the Western Hills. Um, and so people, that's when you start having these satellite cities being built around Beijing, places like Daxing, Tongzhou, and so forth. Now, 
After 2001, though, you know, the impetus was not only on resettling people because of the housing issues, it was also how can you host the Olympics and have this rundown area at the, the center of your city. So you did see posters in my neighborhood of, you know, build a new Beijing, welcome a new Olympics. There's a Tsinghua journalism professor who I quote at the beginning of the book, who he came up with the slogan, New Beijing, New Olympics. But he was really disappointed because he said by New Beijing, he meant you know, a more humanistic, environmentally friendly, forward-thinking Beijing. And he said developers and city officials have taken his slogan and made it into something else. You know, we'll construct an entirely new Beijing. The big thing that changed after 2001 and after the Olympics were awarded later um, is that you no longer were assigned a new house. You were given funding for your existing space. And with that, you could purchase property. Again, I was surprised in, when I was researching the book, people weren't so angry about being moved out of their place as they were the money they were getting because the standard was 8,000 yuan a square meter, you know, which is very, very low because that space would go for 25 to 30,000 yuan a square meter at least now. And so if people had kids in school or had jobs inside the city, this was going to mean they're going to move way, way out to places without services. Beijing's subway system and bus system has gotten much better in the last three years. But at the time, it was a real hardship to be moved out so far away and away from your community. And in the book, I, I do follow two people who actually follow this <laughs> elaborate legal appeal process to try to get more money for your settlement. And that's very common, too. Beijing is rare, or China's rare, uh, like America, and that allows class action lawsuits. And in the beginning, there were, you know, 10,000 people putting their names on a lawsuit and trying to sue the developer or the construction, the construction company. Uh, but as it's the same now in Beijing, a lot of lawyers or lower-level courts just won't take on these cases anymore. They won't go any further. So you were really left on your own to negotiate your settlement that you wanted. Now, once you sign the agreement, oh, I should stop here and say, too, in my neighborhood, on this site came this. And it was a schematic for what was going to happen to our neighborhood. And the idea was is that they'd refurbish uh, Dashalar to bring back its imperial era appearance. So if you've been to Xinjiang and Shanghai, you know this is pretty common in China right now. You know, we'll have these fake looking old buildings, but then look who the tenants are going to be. And this actually came to pass. This, you can visit this right now. So once you sign your agreement, uh, you know, it's very quick. They don't want people squatting and remaining in the house. Uh, they come and knock it down rather quickly. And where this set of courtyards were is where this is now. And I showed you that road on the map when we began. This is the city planning exhibition center. Tiananmen Square is right here. Um, and again, Beijing is so large, any city is, that it's really hard for one hand to know what the other hand is doing often. Beijing doesn't have a Robert Moses or an Ausman like Paris did. Um, saying, we're going to do this and you're going to like it. You know, in 20 years, I'll be proven right. It's a lot of behind the scenes, not a lot of transparency. And that's another thing that obviously frustrated people when they were having their housing negotiations is how do we know what's really happening and how much you're selling this land for and who's going to be here? And a perfect example of that is this is the city planning exhibition center. There's a warning sign on the ticket window there that says, the exhibits inside will not tell you if your neighborhood is going to be torn down. No refunds. Because so many people bought tickets and went in thinking, oh, I'll see a map of what Beijing will look like, and I can tell what's going to happen. The woman who designed this road quit in protest. She wanted to do a uh, tunnel underneath the existing courtyard homes. Uh, the district government here disagreed. So she quit, and she moved over to my side of the neighborhood. We have a different kind of street that she designed that's much narrower. But, you know, this is a four-lane road. There's a bike lane, but there's also a bus lane. It's quite large. I don't know the name of this. This is the one that runs right up to the southeast corner of Tiananmen Square through Shen You can picture, I don't, I don't know the official name, I think it's Chi something. I should look that up. It's not Mei Shi Jie. Mei Shi Jie is on my side. Yeah, this is the other side. Now, right where this truck is here is where I would sit and eat these. This is Dao Xiaomian, knife shaved noodles. And that was made by Soldier Liu and his family here. Soldier Leo was a cook out in Xinjiang, and his mom wears his apron, which I think is so cute. Um, <laughs> but they, um, when I did journalism in China, I always felt like I wasn't doing the entire story because, you know, 10% economic growth, people are moving around. If you do a bad news story, check in with the people a year later. Maybe their lives are quite different. And I met them by chance um, because I, I like their noodles. And because they were renting this noodle shop when it was torn down to make the road, they received no compensation, nothing. 
their landlord got the compensation because it was his building. So their entire life savings was gone. And I went and visited them. They live south of Pingyao in Shanxi in central China. They were, have a, soy bon, a soybean farm. And I went and visited them after they had lost everything. And, you know, things were bleak. They thought, we don't know what we're going to, we're going to have to just be farmers again. But lo and behold, a year later, they raised enough capital through friends and family, came back to Beijing, found a better noodle shop, two stories on my side of the street, uh, and business is booming. And if you're going to Beijing this summer, please go visit them. They love it. Absolutely love it. And Silder Leo sometimes signs the book, which I think is so cute. <laughs> His ambition right now is he wants to open an internet cafe that only uses Macintosh computers. I think it's pretty smart. <laughs> He's diversifying away from noodles, you know. Another character um, I follow in the book is Recycler Wong. He's right in front of my house, right here. And he makes his living buying plastic bottles. And in the book, I go with him out to Trash City, which is this enormous city of trash where all the recyclers go, you know, at 3 in the morning. And you literally go to the pillow family and give them your recycled pillows that you bought. And they sell it to you for a little bit of a markup. And then you go to the hubcap family, and they sell them your hubcaps you bought for that day. A very, very intricate. And he records it all in a notebook with a pencil. His margins are very low. Um, and, but trash is like a commodity. It's like buying stocks. He'll, he'll wait until the price of plastic bottles go up, you know, a mile per 1,000. And then he'll bring all the bottles out. So sometimes I would watch him, you know, buying bottles for a price I knew that was higher than he could get. And he said, oh, just wait. Just wait. I'll wait on it. He really reminded me of Milo Minderbinder in Catch-22. <laughs> Milo buys eggs for 15 cents and sells them for 10. And they say, Milo, how do you make money? And he says, volume. <laughs> <laughs> this is my star student, little Leo here, um, who now is tested into the best middle school in Beijing and speaks English almost as good as mine. She's in grade 9 now. Uh, but we're up on her dad's rooftop here in the courtyard, and he has pigeons, which is an interesting, he was interesting to me for the book, too, because there's that tradition, again, of some people in the Hutong who raise pigeons, yeah, don't want to leave because they can't have pigeons in the new parts of Beijing. But it was neat, you always, I didn't have a clock in the classroom, but I kind of did, because at 3 o'clock you'd hear the Wan Bao, you know, the Beijing evening news guy coming through, and at 4 o'clock you'd hear that mournful whistle, you know, the, the low whistle sound swooping over you. Um, he, he has friends who do the prisoner of war game too. Where they try to get their neighbor's pigeons to fly into their coop. Then they go out for beer and they do prisoner exchanges you know, over the table to give back the pigeons. Um, a word about preservation in Beijing. This is Zhang Jinxi, who's got a, uh, he runs a really nice website called memoryofchina.org. And Zhang Jinxi is a rare preservationist um, and historian who actually lives in this heritage. I mean, this is Le Corbusier, when he wrote about Paris in the 20s and wanted to tear Paris down, he said, I'm so sick of hearing about the Committee to Save Paris. You know, they go into old Paris and they say, oh, what a beautiful raw iron, you know, balcony or something. Then they go back to their homes with gardens and they don't know what it's like to actually live in these areas. Well, John Jin Xi has a lot of credibility, I think, because he actually lives in this area. And he received a grant from the Ford Foundation to go around and not just take photos of the houses, because that's been done ad nauseum and postcards. But he actually um, put together an oral history project where he's interviewing people about how did you get here, uh, what do you like about it, what do you not like about it. And now he has a network of people doing this in Harbin, Tianjin, Dalian, uh, Kunming, all over China. His website's really nice. It's memoryofchina.org. Very interesting guy. Uh, about ten more photos on the Hutong. I'll wrap up. This is the star of the book. This is the widow, uh, my neighbor who lived most of her life in this one, you know, in a space that's no bigger from where Ben is sitting here, you know, just across the room here, and raised two kids and a grandchild in this space, and uh, was as much, you know, the home to me as the, the pillar, the, the, the wood timber and the, the, the walls and stuff itself. She really represented the house. And when I first moved in, I thought, I met her and I thought, my first thought when I saw her was, this isn't going to work. You know, she's going to look at me and be like, no way. Uh, and instead she said, I have one rule for living here. And I said, what's that? She said, public is public, private is private. I said, okay. She said, say it. I said, okay, public is public, private is private. And then she proceeded to break that rule every day, <laughs> starting at 5.30 the next morning. when she I didn't have a lock on my door. When she walked into my room unannounced, woke me up, told me I was being lazy, handed me a bowl of steaming dumplings saying, you have to eat more. Cigarette going with the ash coming in, the flying horse cigarette. 
And I said, I, uh, public, I thought public is public and private. And she said, everything's public. That <laughs> 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 was great. <laughs> She was really fun, and she used to call me every name in the book and hit me up. You know, you idiot, you dolt. And so she was really kept me in line. She was fun. She was afraid to move out of the house. Um, I was gone for Spring Festival one year, and so were our neighbors because they were all migrants. She was the only native Beijinger who lived here. And it really struck her for the first time that she couldn't do this anymore. If there was a fire, she couldn't have gotten out. If she was sick, she needed an ambulance. An ambulance couldn't have gotten in to the lane. Um, so there definitely was that, you know, realization of this isn't such a great place to be living if you're elderly. Um, and it, she was terrified of moving out, though. And the reason was, as you alluded to, is she thought, if I live on an upper floor of a building, I'll have to take the elevator. And if I go down outside and the elevator's broken, I'm going to have to spend the night outside. I can't climb the stairs back up. You know, it's this really interesting mentality. Um, and she did eventually move. And it's funny, she sold this place to a cop who never occupied it. And when I said, I never see you around here. What are you doing? He said, oh. Right now, if they tear down the neighborhood, I'll get maybe 12,000 yuan a square meter. But I know in two years, if they tear down the neighborhood, I'll probably get 18,000 yuan a square meter. So he was actually, there's a market in Beijing speculating on your demolition costs. This is how I'd usually start my winter mornings. I love being at the library in 42nd because I would start in Bryant Park skating in the morning. But I played hockey with the same group of guys uh, every day across the years. Uh, the, this is facing the Forbidden City here. The sun would come up over the moat. Uh, this was a nice part of old Beijing, you know, and I, in the book I talk about this. When you look back on the histories, ice skating was a big part of Beijing culture. People used to have races all the way out to Tongzhou, which was Tongxian then, and back. You know, you'd go out to Tongxian, buy something to prove that you had made it all the way out there, those 20 kilometers, and then skate all the way back in. Um, and, you know, it was great playing hockey in the morning. We'd do it before sunrise, but then I was stuck, you know, sweaty and freezing cold, biking back to the neighborhood, and I'd have to go to the bathhouse. Um, because we didn't have hot water in our house because we had this warning painted on a wall quite near us, which is guard against coal poisoning. Um, until recently, the Beijing government's actually improved this a great deal because they put new circuit breakers in. The first day I got in my house, I plugged in my refrigerator and it blew the fuse box because this is old rickety wiring, you know? And so I didn't have an electric heater even. I just mummified myself with sleeping bags in the wintertime. Um, and one of the reasons is parents of one of my students asphyxiated right as I started teaching there uh, because people used to burn the little coal honeycomb cakes, you know, and they'd have, if there was a leak in the pipe, uh, that sulfur, you know, would poison you. And so in our house, we decided not to burn. Actually, the widow was the only one who burned. Uh, my neighbors and I all just mummified ourselves. So I didn't have any hot water, so I'd go to the bathhouse, which you can imagine is very public. You know, there's no separators between, and a lot of the old guys would be in there in the morning with their yenjing bottles, you know, drinking beer as the water came down over them. Um, so the bathhouse didn't bother me as much because there was a sauna, and it was, it was very social. But, of course, what bothered me was this. Um, and so I do have to do the obligatory word on the hutong bathrooms. Um, good riddance. Uh, the widow was lucky. The women's was right across from our front door, so she had to walk all of maybe 10 meters. Mine was a good seven-minute walk away, and I had this walk timed flat. As you can imagine, I could do this in the dark with my eyes closed anywhere. And the funny thing, there's no dividers in here either. Uh, very social. And um, <laughs> one thing that happened after the Olympics is that uh, advertising, you know, crept into every corner of Beijing, including the taxi cabs where you have TV screens. And advertising came to our toilet as well. And this is what you would look at when you would squat down. <laughs> And this is a list of symptoms you could be checking yourself for, the things that, you know, the hospital would take care of. If anybody can help, help me find this guy, I, this guy's agent told him, like, I've got a great campaign for you. And he has no idea. I like this, too, because in the run-up to the Olympics, there was a rectification of English campaign, and so Dongda became the proctology hospital. But I like the old, you know, Chinese is so direct. I prefer the old translation better. Uh, a couple more slides. You know, again, something bad about living in the lanes is that my students never kicked a soccer ball on grass. They didn't have room to fly a kite because there was too many wires overhead. This is the largest open space in Dajalan, you know, and it's a school yard. And it's so narrow that there's not even basketball hoops facing each other. They have one here and one here. They shoot on this one, run across half court, shoot on that one, run across half court, shoot on this one. Here they are doing their morning exercises. But it, very, very small. And Jane Jacobs, you know, the great New Yorker, is celebrated for her, her spirited defense of community and having eyes on the street. 
Uh, but this can get really annoying, too, you know, when you have people watching you all the time. And my co-teacher said that her first kiss as a teenager came in a taxi cab because they had no pri- privacy. You know, they had to get in a car and go loop around different roads. Uh, and that warmed me after a while, you know, always being around people, pinballing your way through the day. You know, we did get a park on the corner, but of course, this being New Beijing, you can't really do anything in the park. So when they put the park in, it came with a bunch of caveats, including a balan, you know, a security guard standing on the corner of it to make sure you couldn't do anything fun. But <laughs> that was another funny thing. You know, Beijing people are conspiracy theorists anyway. I think you know they they, they know they know the reason behind everything all the time. You know, the shadow shadow here, right? The the um, the alleyway gossip. And one of the rumors that was a big deal in our neighborhood was that um, the reason the Hutong were being torn down is it gave people places to hide after demonstrations, let's say. And, you know, in Beijing right now, there's closed-circuit television cameras everywhere, going up everywhere. And our neighborhood was very rare, including our school, that we didn't have those cameras, you know. And so, again, it was that weird feeling when you'd step out of the lane to a park like this and all of a sudden see a security guard, you know, and signs telling you what not to do. Because life inside the lanes is very organic and kind of freewheeling, or we think it is. I don't know if that's true, but um, this is my co-teacher's home that she grew up in, and the day it was marked. Again, I was just very, you know, another thing, I, another sweeping generalization I'll make about Beijingers is that they're very pragmatic and um, not very sentimental, actually. And I was a little surprised, though. You know, we came to her house, and here I am. I'm down. I was sketching her drum stones and looking at the history of the house and stuff. I'm like, oh, this is architectural heritage. It's being lost and stuff. And my co-teacher had no interest in it whatsoever. She was down here staring at the trees because she remembered as a little girl eating yu char, you know, eating the, the seeds that would fall from the trees or taking walks with her grandmother. You know, for her, the home was a, a place with memories of inhabited memories, not just brick and wood, which is what it was to me. Her house was torn down to make way for Walmart, ironically. She fought the settlement. They wanted to give her 8,000 yuan a square meter. Uh, she thought people were very fair to her, and she ended up with double that. She ended up with 15 to 16,000 a square meter. For her, she was happy to leave because she wanted to have a baby, and it was just impossible. How do you have an infant child in a house without you know, quality heat or a toilet or running water, hot water for that matter? Um, but she used to be able to walk to school, which is only 10 minutes away. Now she has an hour and a half commute each way. She lives out in Dasing in the south uh, with an apartment with a grandmother and grandfather next door to her. But her grandparents are, are depressed and don't have that, you know, they miss their street life and their interactions with other people. That hasn't filled in yet. A couple more slides about, you know, what's coming on in the outskirts of Beijing. You know this, you've been, you know, this idea again that we'll name these developments after something that sounds foreign. Um, you get stuff like this. And oftentimes audiences in the States especially will ask me, like, well, do Chinese want to live like Americans do? And I would say, I don't think... I don't think it's about America. I think it's about just being modern, you know, and having, again, uh, modern conveniences. But one thing that is interesting, this is out in Tiantongyuan, which is, I think, the world's biggest housing development. There's 200,000 people that live out here. Um, You know how it is, though, these new developments, you don't have commercial space on the ground floor because commercial space is usually run by YD, by outsiders. Um, And that's seen as a safety issue or a hygiene issue or some sort of face issue. And so they really are bedroom communities, and now Beijing is being ringed by these things. I took this picture in 2006 as an example of like a soulless Beijing neighborhood, and boy, did this teach me a lesson, though, because that's the thing about writing about cities. You know, they're constantly changing, and things in Beijing that once looked sterile, it's amazing how quickly they fill in with life and don't look sterile anymore. Uh, This actually has (laughs) dug up trees from the countryside and planted full trees here, and there is a strip of restaurants over here now, and it is a bit more lively. And there is a link to the Qingwe, to the light rail out here now, too. This is what's happening in my neighborhood now. This is ads for million-dollar courtyard homes. So we'll tear down my courtyard home and build a million-dollar one. Everything about this ad made me laugh because it's everything that, you know, Chairman Mao tried to eradicate, especially in our neighborhood. The skull cap, the queue, the silk gown, the buck tooth Chinese person, you know, doing his call. Even dialect. You know, officially in Beijing, we live in Dajalan. You know, on all, you would never say Dajalar in official documents because that's Beijing Hua. Um, and again, this idea of selling history. And the other thing that fascinates me about these ads is they're all in English. They're aimed at Hong Kong, Taiwan, Singapore, and overseas people coming back. No Chinese characters in any of these. This is what the edge of our neighborhood looks like now. Uh, that's the front gate, which is what I started with. And here's the pilo. 
kind of an Epcot Center idea. I showed you that schematic of Starbucks coming in. The idea, let's let's tear down the old neighborhood and build it so it looks old. And you know, the developer of this was Soho, which is Beijing's, I think, probably best regarded developer. And the chairman of Soho, the woman, Zhang Xin, she's been very nice to me and was always granting interviews and was very transparent about what was going on, at least to a certain degree. And she said, you know, you don't get it. Like, there's no person that just approves the plan. She said, we've been, this is plan 32 to get to this level because what will happen is some vice mayor will come in and say, I think the lamp should be you know, shaped like bird cages. And so you go back to the drawing board. And she said, it's all a trade-off of trying to do the least amount of harm. And I will say that in Beijing's defense. You can look at these new areas or new buildings and think, well, what might have been here instead? Because there's plenty of areas of new Beijing that look you know, awful. If you've been over to Sidon and things that have happened mm-hmm. there. Um, you know, it's a little Epcot Center-ish, sure. Uh, and yes, the shops are H&M and Zara and Starbucks. We've lost our banks. And there's, the post office is still there. But one thing I, you know, that's interesting about it is there's benches. It's a rare new development in Beijing that allows the public to sit down and rest and take a look. But again, this is what's taking the place of this. This is my last slide of Beijing. Um, that very dense you know, urban feel. The global economic crisis was awful for, uh, it seems, every sector of the economy in the world except for housing preservation because there's simply no funding to relocate 57,000 people in my neighborhood. And so as the book was going to press, um, the signs went up that they were tearing it down. Then the signs came down again. The next year, the signs went up again, and the signs came down again. I was just back at Christmas. The signs were up again, and some of the lanes on the far edges are starting to be chipped away at now. And uh, it, under the guise of road building for this time. So it's going. So again, if you're going to be in Beijing this summer, uh, I would definitely go and visit people. They like talking about it um, and so forth. I will close with five slides real quick to show you. I've gone from this to this. And the first book is about urban, you know, change to urban China and Beijing history. The next book I'm working on now is about rural China. And I've been living up in a place that to me is heaven. Uh, up in Jilin province near the North Korean border. Uh, I love Manchurian history. I'm really interested in Dongbei and the Northeast. A Jesuit priest came through this area in the 1800s and he said, although we cannot know where God created paradise, we can be sure he chose some other place than this. (laughs) But but I love it. I'm next to the Sengari, the Songjian River. I'm near the foothills of Changbaishan, the mountains. Um, Again, where I grew up in Minnesota, this to me is, it feels like home. And the goal of this book, I'm really tired of, oh, China's changing, China's changing. Let's document China's change. Oh, it's changing. Did you hear it's changing? Everything's changing, guys. You know, <laughs> we're changing right now. I think we need to leave that narrative a little bit. And I'm doing this book just about this one rice field. It's the size of an American football field. And I'm just writing about, you know, here it is in winter. Here it is as they're draining it, getting ready for planting. And here it is in full ear. Um, I'm just writing about this area and what's changed, and a lot of it hasn't changed, actually, but there's a lot of history that's gone on in Northeast China, as you know. I'm teaching again because I have to do something useful in the village. These students have nothing but space around them. Uh, I went back for Christmas, and it was really funny. You know, they're out playing basketball. It's minus 20, you know, and they, they're not phased by it at all. Uh, I'm again with grade four students, and I'll show you one more slide. I live... at least have proper plumbing? They don't have proper plumbing. We go outside. I don't know. I live in a farmhouse. So I live in an outhouse and the whole deal. I'm a glutton for this stuff. People keep telling me that. Like, you don't have, you can do other things. You don't have to keep doing the same book. But I live um, near the Museum of Natural History. And it was funny to travel 6,000 miles, go all the way back. It takes a long time to get up to the farm. And the day I showed up at school, the kids were watching Night at the Museum, which is set in the Museum of Natural History. And it really did to me, which became full circle of how small this world has become. So I'll end there. Thank you. Yeah, good question. question already. Um, Yeah, I was born in my question is really regarding like the some kind of basic statistical figures sure. on school zones. Um, uh-huh. You know, obviously in terms of Beijing as a whole, it's a very it's a very large uh, city by by area. Mm-hmm. So is there some type of like statistic 
that computes the you know the, the annual uh, you know um, uh, you know uh, I guess you would call that uh, you know um, taking down the futon like where yeah it's the, interesting the, 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 it's so large you know statistics yeah the the size of you know Beijing municipality is the size of Connecticut it's that large but this area again I'm talking about is just that size of Manhattan. Um, Again, all the census are different. Um, I think I came up with a number that I believed in that it was about 12,000 Hutong to begin, and now it's at about 1,500. And the wave of the destruction started in 91. You've got all these edges coming in. So if you think of like what the second ring road is now, as we see Dong Zhiman, Dong Su Shitiao, Chang'an, you know, these are bigger projects where people actually stayed. They built housing projects there that keep the Hutong name, and the residents there stayed in those apartments along the edges. So that was the first wave to fall. But the densest neighborhoods, again, are these areas here, and they're nominally protected. But again, the way Beijing thinks it's protecting something is to tear it down off and build anew, which is that's true for Japan and Korea and Taiwan. That's true of a lot of Asian preservation. Um, but the wave of it, of it really hitting its peak was the early 2000s, and then right as the Olympics were approaching, more and more fell. So at its high point, you were getting like 800 being torn down a year, this low point now, there's not that much left to tear down, so it's maybe up to 100. What's hard about it, though, is that, you know, Chinese architecture is hidden. Like, you can't tear down Notre Dame Cathedral or the Colosseum in Rome. It's public architecture. It's, a, it's made of stone, so it lasts better. But if somebody starts taking a, a sledgehammer to one of those structures in Paris or Rome, people say, hey, what are you doing? They all see it. I was amazed in our lane. You know, I'd come home to the widow and say, you know, they're tearing down the streets over here. I'd say, what's that got to do with me? And she couldn't see it because she wouldn't go down there. And I'd be like, well, it has a lot to do with you. You know, you're next. Um, and that's what's really hard for these neighborhoods is that they, they fall and people don't know they're being torn down. Yeah. But the statistics are really unreliable. And, you know, Beijing is kind of like London now like with Covent Garden or with Paris on the left bank. You know, the area here around the Drummond Bell Tower here and the, and the lakes um, is pretty well preserved. And it's being preserved because it's economic use, restaurants and hutong tours and stuff. But in a way, it's kind of that area on the lakes is reverting to what it was a hundred years ago, which was a playground for the rich. You know, it wasn't uh, it wasn't working class people. And the other thought I'll add to that too is I do I can sympathize a bit with the Beijing government, which is that housing was deemed a basic right in '56. It wasn't going to be a commodity, and so rents were subsidized to be about the price a month rent would be about how much it would cost to buy a pack of cigarettes. So for the Beijing city government, it's like some people to them, you've been on the dole for 50 years. You know, you've been paying 10 yuan, 17 yuan a month for rent to live in the center of town. And that's, you know, that's not tenable anymore. We don't want to fund that anymore. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, the way you get promoted in the Communist Party isn't to preserve things. It's to develop things, to raise financing. Um, so I can see that. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Thanks. I think, you know, and again, Beijing is rare for a world capital in that it wasn't really damaged in World War II because the capital was elsewhere. Japanese occupied it but didn't, didn't do any upkeep for sure, but also didn't burn stuff down. Um, and so it's rare that, you know, to be able to talk about Beijing in the way we are for a modern global city because this has already played itself out. Moscow has been rebuilt seven times. London burned down. has been rebuilt several times. <laughs> New York City has transformed. We're probably on the third go-round of big transformation here. Um, so it's interesting to talk about Beijing that there is so much left, actually. We could be an optimist and say it's interesting that there is a lot still there that we can see. Mm-hmm. Stop praising me. I, I, you, be more Chinese, you guys. Come on, peeping walk. I can't think of anything, but this reminds me of what I said in Beijing, actually, about the Hong Kong Mm-hmm. So I, as a friend of mine, who's a 
you observe I'm sorry I'm sorry. No, please. No. So like how can the neighbors because people then what we were talking about the neighbors were fun. I mean, there was posters up all over, like, don't listen to rumors. You know, if you, if somebody says they'll get you a better settlement, how do you know they're not really grabbing the apartment with a better view? And I mean, it was really divide and conquer. And the idea was that you had to resolve things individually. And the way you started that was with the demolition company, the Chai Tian, you know, the people who were doing that. And then you would, if you, that, and that was videotaped always. There was a police officer in the room that was videotaped. You stood up and gave your case about why you deserve more compensation. And then if that wasn't resolved, the city would appoint a mediator, or the district government would appoint a mediator to sit down with you with the development company, the destruction company, sorry. And then you go to the development company and keep going up. It was a long process, really protracted, but civil. And usually, I don't know what you found, people were usually angry at the assessment of how big their place was. They'd say, you're telling me it's 17 square meters, but you're not counting... You know, the space between the ledge and the windowsill. You know what I mean? And then they'd say, well, I, want, I, I want 20 square meters, that sort of thing. Which made sense. They were trying to get all the money they could. Right. Yeah. We were more focusing on how people try to resolve the amount of stuff. Oh, that you meant. I'm sorry, yeah. Yeah, because they were. Cleavers. <laughs> Good old knife fights. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I've been part of these. Yeah. <laughs> It was a constant ballet of, of yeah, not making anybody upset when you live that close to one another. And some, I was lucky because we all got along. Like my co-teacher, she hated her neighbors. They had a dog that was always barking, or you know, I was just like really angry at one another. And they, you know, it was funny. It's, people just felt stuck. Like you know, we were assigned this house, and now we have to make do with these people around us. So. Oh sure. Oh my gosh. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. The Jiwei Hui, the neighborhood committee, would do that in our neighborhood as well. Yeah. Oh. Yes. Let's uh, keep make this the last question. I was in about three weeks ago. And at that you were in my time, neighborhood. In Get out. Is it still there? The area between the Yoli Chan and the and the Joshua. Yeah. Did you go by my house? I love those. Did you say hi to anyone for me? I found your house. Do I owe somebody twenty bucks? Okay. At that time, three weeks ago, I looked for the signs and I didn't. They seem to be down again now. Oh, interesting. When I was there at Christmas, they were all. It's this rim right here. If I go even closer. Yeah. This all right here. This is where the old opera house is, the beautiful opera house. Yeah, that, when I was there, was all being taken down, and the idea was to build either a road or a moat. This is that road I showed you, the new road here. This is Maysher's, yeah, which is narrower and much prettier. There's places to sit. There's pavilions and stuff along it. The, the urban, she did a nice job with that. But the plan is now is this road right here is going to bisect all the way through, and this will be a wider road here to take pressure off Chemin, uh she does, yeah. yeah. There seems to be some attempt in the area west of the major job to, to spruce it up rather than... They did a nice job. This is Dashar Lar yeah. uh, which is really pretty now. There's actually signs up. Yes, yeah. People credit me for this, by the way, which is really funny. It's always the neighborhood gossip. It's like, when Jabba must have read your book. I'm like, I really don't think Premier Wen <laughs> was up at night, you know, turning the pages. Like, I got to make, let's go protect the neighborhood. But What's well, funny with anything that I should say is that it's not that it's true or not, it's that people believe it's true. That's what I think is most telling of his relationship with the government in Beijing. Yeah. Go ahead. Well, I was going to say, he may not have read it, but you all should. It's really wonderful. And with that, we're closed. We're at 7 o'clock. Perfect. Thanks, Thanks for having me.